Praise the Lord, everybody. So good to see everybody in the house of the Lord this morning. Just a quick announcement before we get the service started. Uh, we do have a staff nursery available um, in this service. If you have any questions, you can go right outside in the lobby and they can direct you. We also have a cry room available um, and you can, you can use that as well. Uh, could we all stand in the house of God to, to this morning? I want to read Psalms 103, and it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. For who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from destruction who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. My mind is on my king today, who saw me in the depths of destruction, but pulled me out into his marvelous light. My mind is on the king who healed my body, my great and marvelous king. Could we lift up our hands today and begin to pray and begin to worship that king of glory? Lord, today, we're here with the heart of worship, Lord, a heart of reverence, Lord, bless you with all my soul. Everything that's within me, Lord, I give you praise. I give you honor. And I give you glory today. And I pray that you would have your way in this service today. In Jesus' name.
Jesus, to a God who is worthy of our praise. We thank you today. We bless your name. Can you just lift that name today? Oh, Jesus, we lift your name on high. Lord, we know it's your name that has all power and authority. Lord, it's known by your name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Lord, so we bless your name and we magnify you for that today. Oh, hallelujah. Why don't you just shout his name one time, Jesus. Oh, one more time, say Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you look at your neighbor and tell him you're glad to see him in church today. And you may be seated. We'd like to just take a moment uh, to welcome all of our guests. Uh, New Life, if you're a guest with us here in service, we're so thankful that you're here. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment and stepping out to our Connect Center after service is done, uh, we have a special gift for you. like to just thank you for being in service with us today. New Life, could we give a hand to all of our on-site guests? Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And we'd also like to thank you, anybody watching online, whatever platform you're watching on, we're so thankful that you're worshiping with us today at at New Life. And New Life, could we give them a hand as well? Why don't you look at your neighbor and tell them your favorite Thanksgiving dish, dish from this past week while Pastor comes. Thank you, Pastor Jace. Good morning, everybody. Everybody feeling good after Thanksgiving? Amen. It is good to see you in the house of the Lord. And uh, I understand you have got over your tryptophan uh, addiction to turkey. And you're in the house of the Lord today. Amen. But it is great to see you. We welcome you. We pray that this has been a great week for you and your family. And it is good to be back in church on Sunday morning. It is good to be able to lift up hands and voices and magnify the Lord. He is worthy of our praise today. Amen. Stacy and I had the wonderful privilege on Thursday evening to join with our Celebrate Recovery ministry and have Thanksgiving dinner with several folks from around our community. There was probably 30 people that joined us for dinner on Thursday night. And I just want to say thank you to the team. Uh, I don't know how many of them are in the house today, but if they are, when I call your name, Stan, uh, Jimmy and Miranda Leonard did such a good job putting all of that together. <clears throat> Amen. Miranda fixed homemade rolls on Thursday night. We give God praise for that. Brenly and Jewel were such a great help. Zane and Kylie Plumley. Terry, is Terry here today? Terry was, she's a great volunteer for our Celebrate Recovery ministry, uh, cooking and helping. But would you give, regardless of who helped, all the volunteers, give all this team a great hand. They were such a blessing to to our church and through our church at Thanksgiving. Amen. So thank you very much to them. This is a very exciting week for our church. This is Dinner Theater Week at New Life. And uh, we've been looking forward to this for the last three years. We haven't had dinner theater since 2000, somebody help me, 2018, Pastor Larry? Uh, 2018, since we had last had dinner theater due to schedules and COVID and all of that. Uh, but if you want to enjoy Christmas, you want to eat well, and you want to laugh, then you need to come to dinner theater at least Thursday, Friday, or Saturday of this week. Uh, It's going to be a great, great time. There are tickets for sale. You can see the uh, marketing information in the lobby on that. You can get online and get tickets. It really is a fun, fun time uh, this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And there's a lot of people going to be working around the campus throughout the week. No ministries here on campus Wednesday night. And then remember next Sunday, which is the first Sunday of December, everyone will meet at 1030 a.m. That will start our day right here in the worship center for service. Also, let me just mention, I I talked to you about this last Sunday morning, but uh, Amanda Williams passed away, was connected to our church a number of years ago. Uh, Her funeral service is going to be this coming Saturday at 11 o'clock right here in the worship center. So please be aware of that, and I hope you'll come and support her family. I want you to stand with me if you would, please. There is an agricultural theme that is woven throughout the scriptures. Now, we live in an agricultural state. Uh, You don't go very far from here. In fact, you go a little bit north of Cabot, and you're in farming country, 
or you go to the east part of our state and you're in the rice fields. And so we understand agriculture in Arkansas. But there is an agricultural theme woven throughout all of Scripture. Paul talks about it in the book of Galatians chapter 6 when he says this, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And then Paul says this, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh, everybody say of the flesh, reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, everyone say to the Spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And there is a principle found in this passage of harvest and sowing, and sowing and harvest. And the principle is what you put in the ground will come up. And if what I sow is just earthly things, then I can expect just earthly harvest. But if I sow to the Spirit, I can expect a spiritual harvest that goes far beyond my empowerment. Now, how many of you have served God long enough to see that when you and I sow into spiritual things, like the church, it produces a harvest in our life that goes far beyond what we could ever imagine. You know, you know why that happens? Because that's in the Bible. We sow to the Spirit, and we will from the Spirit. And I'm so glad the Apostle said we will reap if we sow. And we can expect the blessing of God. We're very upfront and honest with every person that comes to this church and attends this church. We depend on people's faithfulness in giving. And thank you for giving. Thank you for being so faithful, so many of you. Uh, so many of you practice tithing, that first 10% of your, your increase. And then there's others that practice giving uh, above and beyond that tithe, free will offerings. We thank you for that. And we're, we're grateful we have this opportunity to give. I want our ushers to make their way up to the front if they would right now. And we're going to give as unto the Lord. Amen. These ushers are looking sharp today. We're going to bless the Lord in prayer. And then we are going to come. Those of you that have something to give live here in person, check or cash, uh, you can give that in the basket right here. We have online giving options, text to give options. And I was talking to someone recently and they said to me, I am so thankful for online giving, Pastor, because it is just the way it's done today. And I can give and be done with it. I don't have to remember to bring my checkbook or this, this uh, disappearing thing in our culture called cash. But I can give online. And so we have that opportunity for you as well. Let's pray and thank God that he's a good and faithful God. We love you today, Lord. We're so grateful for how you blessed. And this weekend of Thanksgiving, we're saying thank you, Lord, for all of your provision in our life. I thank you to be among people that practice sowing to the Spirit and seeing spiritual things come, Lord, beyond our power. Jesus, I thank you for so many stories of that in this congregation. Lord, would you help us? Would you empower us to think right about giving, Lord? I pray that you will bless the, the gifts that are given today, tithing and offerings. I pray, Lord, that you will help us as a church and me as a pastor and we as leaders, Lord, to be very wise in our stewardship of every dollar that comes through this local church. We need that wisdom, Lord, and we ask and claim that in Jesus' name. Bless your people today, Lord. And I thank you for the promises of your blessings. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I remember being in college when someone stood up and received an offering in church, and they said, let's come with a cheerful heart. And I watched a guy in the balcony of the church come cackling and laughing down the stairs. He was in the balcony and he laughed his way all the way down the stairs with a smile on his face, came up, Brother Andre, and put his offering and tithing in and was just rejoicing. And I thought to myself, two things. First thing I thought was, well, that's a little strange, <laughs> just to be honest with you. The second thing I thought was, I want to be like that. I want to have that kind of mentality that we are blessed to give. It's not I have to or it's some, we're blessed to be able to give. Amen. So let's give 
with a cheerful heart today. Amen? Amen. And we'll give you an opportunity just to say hi to people around you, and we'll worship in song as well. Let's come and bring our gifts up to the front. May the Lord bless you as you give on this Sunday morning. God bless our praise team as they sing today.
Somebody sing it out today. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Sing there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. So much power.
miracle work even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it, Even when He's I always don't see working. It, you're working. He's always working. Even when I don't see it, you're don't lose working. hope today. He's always working. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop. There's a great anointing in this house right now. Come on, I wish no matter what age you are, where you come from, what your background is, come on, let's reach up to the Lord Jesus right now. Let's reach up to the Lord Jesus right now. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Jesus is here today. Jesus is in this house today. When Jesus is here, anything can happen. Any person can be touched. Any mountain can be brought down. Any valley can be exalted. Anything can happen when Jesus is here. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you for your great worship, your great involvement in this service. Just remain standing if you would. And those of you that are up here at the front, you can make your way back to your seat. But let's stand together right now. Amen. I am so, so grateful. Again, I'll say it again. I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. I may sound like it from time to time. But I never get over having an opportunity to be in the house of God. This hasn't got old to me. Isn't that amazing how you can serve the Lord all the years that you serve him and it never gets old. It's a fresh anointing. It's a fresh impartation from the Lord and I'm thankful for that. Amen. All of our families that are here, you're visiting your family and you're with us today at New Life in Cabot. We welcome you. We hope this is a great, great day for you and time for you. Our college students are home landing. I saw Garrett Thomas here today. Those who have not been here for a while and you're back, we're glad you're back. We welcome you. Welcome home. We're thankful that you're here worshiping with us today. I am so thankful for the body of Christ and I'm thankful for ministry that supports ministry. Over the years, uh, perhaps many of us in this room have uh, situations where we have had a a word spoken in a due season by somebody. And it helped let you know God knows where I'm at. He's helping me. He's guiding me. And I thank God that ministers have that as well. Uh, many years ago, several years ago now, I was introduced to Brother Scott Shelton. He became a fast friend of me and my wife. And our family has, uh, has been such a voice into my personal life. And I'm grateful for that. And he's been a voice into this church in ways that I have shared some of those with you. Others, I just know as a pastor how on he has been as a voice in our church. And several months ago, I felt to invite him to be with us on this Sunday after Thanksgiving. And I just want to say, before Brother Shelton comes, that I believe that while the word is being declared today, that the spirit is going to move. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are going to be in operation there's going to come understanding and revelation and word of knowledge and word of wisdom. I believe God could work a miracle while the word is being preached. I believe somebody's body could be healed while the word is being preached. So we loose that in this house. I speak that right now, that the word of the Lord and the power of God will be evident. I appreciate Brother Scott Shelton. He travels all over the world ministering, but he lives right here in Arkansas. How awesome is that? He's from Alma, Arkansas. How many of you have been to Alma before? Alma's known for two things. Brahms ice cream and Scott Shelton. <laughs> Amen. Would you welcome the man of God back to this pulpit? Brother Shelton, we're glad you're here. Come minister the word of the Lord to us today. Come on. Let's give him a great new life welcome. Welcome back. I love you, man. Don't you love your pastor and first lady? Now you know the rule. You cannot clap louder for a guest speaker than you do your own bishop. Don't you love the bishop and first lady? said this I think in your hearing before but I, I want to say it again thank you for sharing them with all of us and um, I know he travels extensively and uh, probably two things on his mind all the time are doing what the Lord told him to do and getting home as fast as he can and um, thank you so much for loving them covering them their family and um, honoring them, not just in October, uh, but every day. Um, I think pastor's appreciation should start at like 12 midnight on January 1. 
and go through uh, 1159 on December 31st or whatever the last day of the year is. <laughs> Give everybody a chance to catch a breath for one minute and start back over at midnight. And the reason I say that is I read a statistic, y'all probably saw it too, not long ago, of the number of pastors that walk away from the ministry every day or every week. And it was staggering. And I've said a lot of times, if apostolic pastors were an animal, they'd be on the endangered species list. Because I have known a lot of pastors, but not all of them are in it for the kingdom's sake, totally. And um, you have, however, been blessed with a man of God and his wife and family that are in the kingdom for the kingdom's sake. So you love them, you cherish them, you protect them, you guard them, you pray for them, you lift them up. You watch over them and keep sharing them, and God will keep blessing you for it. If you would, turn with me the book of Psalms, chapter number 100, and I do give honor to them. Thank the Lord very, very much for them and how they are fitted so perfectly into the kingdom and for their friendship. He's very kind with his words. You're, you, th listen, you're, you're so blessed to have him and her, and, and I know you know it. But there are some people that come into your life. I think there's really only two types of people in the world, really. There's givers and takers. Now, you can subcategorize them however you want to and break them down into however many little smaller groups you can come up with. But at the end of the day, I think people basically either leave you feeling better or worse about your situation. And um, you know how it is. Sometimes you just feel like you've just had the life sucked out of you and you've been with somebody for three minutes. And um, I know there's nobody here on today like that. I understand that. And I, I realize that y'all all sanctified and washed in the blood. But just trust me when I tell you there are people in the world that would just drain the snot out of you. And uh, don't take them long to do it. But Brother Getty is not one of those people. He challenges me. His Christianity you know, the scripture says they were first called Christians at Antioch. And uh, he would have fit in. They, they would have fit in well in that group. And um, they leave you feeling better. Um, in, in that sense, I'm, I'm saying full of faith that I can do it. I was admiring the building. And let me say to you how beautiful this place is. I, I've just walked around today just looking at it all. And it is so beautiful, and I, I just give thanks to the Lord for all of his blessings. And um, But Brother Gaddy was so kind. I, I was commenting on the building and how beautiful it was, and he just always turning all that back to God. Well, Brother Shelton, God did it. He, the Lord's done it. And um, he did, in fact, but he has to use people. So thank you. Uh, what was I going to do? Oh, we're going to read Psalms chapter number 100, uh, verses 1 through 5. Yep, that's it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. We've done that. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates. Whose gates? His. Enter into his gates. How? With thanksgiving. We've done that. And into whose courts? His. How? With praise. We've done that. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is. That's a definitive statement. The Lord is good. Give thanks unto him. Bless his name. Why? Because he's good because his mercy is everlasting, and because his truth endureth to all generations. If you would, just give the Lord one more uproarious round of applause, and you can seat yourself in Jesus' name.
you can seat yourself in Jesus' name. I want to keep reading that verse, that passage, a couple more times. <clears throat> Give honor to my wife and children. They were going to come with me, but they have all been laid low in the bed of affliction the last two or three days, so they decided they'd probably be better suited to rest, and I felt like that was the Holy Ghost involved in that because sick children in a car with earaches and sore throats and various other ailments. Uh, we're going to read an Amplified Classic Edition, but I do give thanks for my wife. She's a single mom, 220-something days a year by average, and um, she does so awesome with it, and I am just so blessed to have her. Make a joyful noise. Now, this is the Amplified Classic Edition. Uh, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Say, uh, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know or perceive or recognize and understand with approval that the Lord is God. You can't just acknowledge it, but you got to approve of it. Uh, it is he who has made us, not we ourselves, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and a thank offering and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and say so to him. You can't just be thankful, you got to say something. When we say uh, give the Lord glory, that, that means literally to give God glory is when you tell him how good he's been to you. That's when you tell him what you think of him. Not, not quoting scripture, not quoting somebody else's um, statement, but when you begin to tell God how you feel about him, that's when you're giving glory to God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and a thank offering and into his courts with praise. Be thankful and say so to him. Bless and affectionately praise his name. Boy, that rules out those folks that don't want to be emotionally involved, doesn't it? And every man in this room knows that when your wife wants you to be affectionate with her, she's talking about hold her hand in public. Hug her once in a while. Act like you like her. You cannot sit there like a knot on a log and a log in a hole and a hole in the bottom of the sea and claim to be affectionate. You got to hold somebody's hand. Be affectionate with your praise to him. For the Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness and truth endure to all generations. Now I'm going to read my favorite translation, the Passion Translation. Lift up a great shout of joy to Yahweh. Go ahead and do it, everyone, everywhere. Worship Yahweh with gladness. Sing your way into his, boy, isn't that powerful? Sing your way into his presence with joy and realize what his what this really means. We have the privilege of worshiping Yahweh our God, for he is our creator and we belong to him. We are the people of his pleasure. We can, you can pass through his open gates with the, what is that? The password of praise. You can get through his gates with the password of praise, but if you don't have that, you're probably not getting past that gate. <clears throat> you can pass through his open, and they're open too, isn't that powerful? You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. <clears throat> There's a formula for everything. You can't say, I can't find God, I can't get to God. There's a formula right here in the book of Psalms. Come, bring your thank offering to him, and affectionately bless his beautiful name. For Yahweh is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you, so kind that it will astound you, and he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows that our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. I'm going to read that again without interruption just because I like it. <clears throat> Lift up a great shout of joy to Yahweh. Go ahead and do it, everyone, everywhere. Worship Yahweh with gladness. Sing your way into his presence with joy and realize what this really means. We have the privilege of worshiping Yahweh our God. For he is our creator and we do belong to him. 
We are the people of his pleasures. You can pass through the open gates with the password of praise. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come, bring your, off, your thank offering to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. For Yahweh is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you, so kind that it will astound you, and he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. Now I'm going to read that one more time just because I like it. Lift up a great shout of joy to Yahweh. Go ahead and do it, everyone, everywhere. Worship Yahweh with gladness. Sing your way into his presence with joy and realize what this really means. We have the privilege of worshiping Yahweh our God for he is our creator and we belong to him. We are the people of his pleasure. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Bring your thank offering to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. For Yahweh is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you, so kind that it will astound you, and he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. Woo. I could go to my seat right now, and we've had, we've had a moment here. <clears throat> you do what you want to for a couple of minutes. I'll wait on you. Yeah. When you read scripture, you've got to read it with the right inflection. You can't just read it just kind of in a monotone, lift up a great shout of joy to Yahweh. Go ahead and do it, everyone, everywhere. You, you, you've, got to put, you've got to put the same spirit into it that's in it. He's trying to encourage the people of God. Do something different than what you've been doing. Don't, don't just basically go through the motions as mediocre as you can. When you get to that second sentence, sing your way into his presence with joy. You, you want to know how I just can't feel God? Then sing your way into his presence and do it with a heart full of joy. And realize while you're doing that, what that really means. It means that we have the privilege of worshiping our God. For he, and here's where you have to enunciate and use the right inflection. For he is my creator. And you got to make the word personal. He is my creator. And I do belong to him. I don't care what the hounds of hell are saying on the front porch. I do belong to him. I am his. He is my creator. I am one of the people of his pleasure. I can pass with thanksgiving through those gates with the password of praise. I can come right into his presence with thanksgiving. I can do all of those things. I can bring my thank offering to him. And I can affectionately bless his beautiful name. Why? Because he's always been good to me and he's always been ready to receive me. He's so loving that it always amazes me. He's so kind that it always astounds me. He is famous for his faithfulness toward me. Everyone knows that God can be trusted, for he has always kept his promises to every generation. The word of God is quick, and it is powerful, and it is sharper, and it does pierce, and it does divide asunder, and it does do all those things that <clears throat> it says it does, but all of the promises of God are exactly that until we, we decide to put them into motion in our own personal lives. All that God will do is not indicative of all that God is going to do. Everything he can do is not, it's not a definitive 
promise that every time we come to church, he's absolutely going to do it. He's capable of doing it. Brother Wright made a statement to me one time that shocked me. And I think that's why he said it the way he said it. But he said, God don't love everybody. What? For God so loved the world. He said, I didn't say he didn't want to. And I didn't say that he hasn't done things to show his love to everyone. But God does not love everyone because everyone will not let him love them. He said at one point, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you to me, but you wouldn't have anything to do with me. He did not many great works in their midst because of their unbelief. I'd like to say something's been on my mind since I walked in back there. If there's somebody in this room that you're thinking about going into foster parenting and you, you feel like that's what God wants you to do, you, you need to just follow your peace and go ahead with that. God's going to work that out for you. And uh, you're not late to the party. God, God kept you uh, to, to do this at this very moment, at this particular time. And you're in the perfect will of God. Is that all right? <clears throat> so whoever you are, you just go right ahead. But a lot of times we come to church and we're thinking, well, God's going to do all this amazing stuff and I'm just going to sit here and watch him and it's, and, and it's going to happen. And while he may do it for everybody else, just because everybody else is getting something from God don't mean that I'm just naturally going to get something from the splash over. If I'm going to get something from God, it's going to have to be because I intentionally pursued him. <clears throat> there are... Man, 2020, are y'all okay? 2020, if you get, if you get in a bind, just, just make your way out and, and stretch a minute, come on back. Um, 2020 really messed us up uh, because it, it brought about a division of philosophy, I think, in, in the church a lot. And um, opinions became more prevalent than the word did. And I've heard us say more, I think, well, here's what I see, rather than what well, the book says. And in the great scheme of churchdom, we have tried to figure out, is this God's way of saying that what we're doing is wrong? And assembling together, and, and boy, you, it just, it was rampant. There was, and, and I think there were a lot of people that said things, and it was misunderstood that Okay, well, so-and-so said we're not even supposed to be having church. And then we fell in love with online stuff at a, at a level that we never have before. And thank God for it. But if you think that online preaching is going to be free, it's not. Just, just hear me say it on today. They, they're creating databases and your name's on one of them. <laughs> and uh, I've had them censor me while I was preaching, and I didn't know they did it till a day or two later. And people watching... Uh, I was in Indiana at our friends, and stuff began to come out of my mouth, Brother Gaddy, that I didn't, I had no intentions of saying, but the Lord said it. Well, when I did uh, let him say it, um, at that very moment, iPads and laptops and desktops all over the place that were tuned in just blurred out because it was a Facebook feed. And Facebook posted an instant message that says, this content is whatever to our community, something, something, something. And it gave them four options. You can report it and not view it. You can report it and view it. You can view it and not report it. Or you can something just totally disregard this altogether. And if we think that we're going to be online doing all that we're doing for the kingdom and somebody's not watching. But it doesn't change the fact that uh, Paul did say, I've become all things to all people that by any means I can save some. And it is incumbent upon us to trust God and do what God's called us to do as a people to reach the lost with the gospel. And so, <clears throat> but I think one of the things that happened to us over the last couple of years, and I hope we've, we've gotten past it now, but um, trying to figure out if what's, what's right, what's wrong, what's necessary, what's unnecessary about church, what is religious tradition? What is truly being an apostolic? Well, I'll just sum being an apostolic up with this and, and save the longer dissertation of it for a later time. But 
to me, being an apostolic is being obedient to everything God tells you to do, which is what the apostles were. They, they obeyed him. Whatever God told them to do, whatever, whatever commandments they were given, they, they did their best to execute that to the very best of their ability. So <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's methodology. We, we've got to not get hung up on methodology that we can't find root and premise for in Scripture. But there are some things that are going to always be a part of the kingdom. And they're going to always be a part of the kingdom because they are part of the ceremonial and the processional laws that get us into his presence. We are focused on getting God into our presence when he's trying to get us into his. And they're not the same place and they're not the same thing. We issue invitations to him a lot of times. Let's invite the Lord to be a part of this. Well, thanks be to God that we're at least doing that. But the truth be told, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. And this is not about trying to do something to get him to approve of what we're doing. It's us realizing that before the foundation of the world, he had already approved of us. Before he ever put the first grain of sand on the first beach, he had already decided. Go read the book of Ephesians chapter number one. Before he did anything, he loved us. In fact, the scripture says that before anything was ever created, he had already determined to adopt us as his precious children. <clears throat> and so it's not about us coming to church and doing, going through performing arts in order to get God's approval. God approves of us just because we're his children. My three kids, Brother Gaddy, don't have to get my approval every day. They just get to wake up and be my children. And there are certain benefits that come to them that my wife don't understand because she's not my child. <laughs> like, I know I'm a thorn in her flesh. I know that. And it, it is, uh, it's a great scene from time to time when she starts going through toys. Where did these come from, she says, in a tone close to that. She's a lot sweeter. Where, where did all these toys come from? And I hear a chorus of voices drifting down from the second floor. Daddy bought them. She don't understand that because she's not my child. And she asks me stuff all the time. All Malachi's got to do is say, when I'm leaving the house, are you going somewhere? Yeah, I'm running to Walmart. Will you get me a toy? Yes. It drives me nuts because I know it's going to cause problems later on down the road. But Junior's happy. Eliana, one night at 11 o'clock, she came in my office there at the house and in her pajamas, but she had her coat on. It was wintertime. And she said, uh, are you ready? I beg your pardon. For what? To go to Walmart. What? Well, you promised me this morning that if I would clean my room, you would take me to Walmart today. And you don't break your promises, Dad. I said, well, now that you've put it so delicately, let me go get my shoes on. I walked through the living room. There sits Precious. And she said, uh, what, what are you two doing? It's always you two. What are you two doing? I said, well, we're going to Walmart. Do you know it's 11.15 at night at this point? I do. And you're taking her to Walmart? Nope, she's taking me. I'm just driving. <laughs> Why are you going to Walmart? Because apparently this morning I made a statement to her that if she'd clean her room, we'd go to Walmart and she'd get whatever doll she wanted. What, whatever doll she, yes, that was what I said. I didn't mean it like that, but that's what I said. You know this is going to cost you, she says. Yes, I'm aware, but I made her a promise. And I don't want my child growing up thinking that I'm not going to keep my word. If I tell you I'm going to do it to the very best of my ability, I'm going to do what I told you I'd do. Because I want her someday to know that her father will treat her the same way. 
I want her to know that no matter what she has need of, when she has need of it, all she's got to do is call on him about promises that he made her before she was ever in the womb. Do you realize the stuff that we spend copious amounts of our life praying and begging God for you don't even have to pray about? My children do not have to get up every day and ask me to keep them safe. They don't have to watch over or keep, pray for me to watch over them. They don't have to beg me to put clothes on their back. They don't have to beg us to feed them. They don't have to beg us to shelter them. They have learned to understand that the relationship between a child and a parent comes with some pre-built-in expectations that a child has a right to expect of their father. My children have a right to expect food to eat. They have a right to expect me to do whatever I've got to do to feed, house, and clothe them and protect them and shelter them. So as a result of that, they don't spend their life begging me to do it. They live their life expecting me to do it. We in the kingdom look at him only at, we're, we're agnostics, that's what we are, we're agnostics. We believe he's there, but we're not really sure we've got access to him. We're not really sure that he really is, as his word says, moved with our infirmities and our circumstances, and God really is. But if we would ever get a revelation of that and start realizing, you know what? Before I ever knew I was gonna need this, he promised he'd do it. Before I ever knew I was gonna need him to be this to me, he promised he'd be that. So and then all of a sudden, as a result of that revelation, you get to the point that your, your conversation with the Lord becomes less about, Lord, here's what I need, here's what I need, here's what I need. And it becomes more about, Lord, you said, Lord, your word said here in this chapter, in this book, in this verse, you said you'd be an ever-present help in the time of trouble. You said you would make a way of escape when I needed it. You said that you would be sea law to me right here. You said that you were a well-fortified place. You said that you would never leave me nor before I was ever in the womb. You said you would never leave me, you'd never forsake me, and your seed would never be abandoned on the side of the road begging for bread. These are your words, these are your promises, and I expect them to come to fruition in my life. Brother Shelton, you really play? Yes, every day. When I go to Walmart, I do not expect to have to park one zip code over. Well, I think that's stretching it. Then walk. But Chunky not walking if I don't have to. I'm going to park as close to the front door as I can get. And I believe God's got a place for me up there. So you think he loves you more than other people? Yes. Because I let him. Some of y'all just punish yourself all the time. I don't deserve the goodness of God. I don't deserve a touch from God. I'm just going to beat myself and whip myself all day long. And we sit through service after service after service waiting on God to be satisfied with how much punishment we've done to ourselves. What then shall separate us from the love of God? Things to come, things present, height, depth, all of these things. But the one thing that he doesn't mention is the past. And the only reason the past can separate us from the love of God is because we let it. We remember where he brought us from, and we think that's a bad thing. We were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. God did not bring anybody into the kingdom from a position of righteousness. Everybody in this room that's in the kingdom got here from a pit somewhere and miry clay somewhere and a mess somewhere that God dug us out of. Every last one of us. But we are the kings and queens of second guessing. And because we don't know who we are, we have no clue who he is, then we don't have an idea at all who we are to him. And so we live beneath our privileges. But there are ceremonial and processional laws that are a part of the kingdom. And there's no place in scripture that I found, Brother Gaddy, where worship and praise and thanksgiving is never gonna be a part of getting into his presence. Whether we're assembled here together in a corporate gathering or church service or assembly or whatever you want to call it, or you're at home by yourself or we're doing small groups, whatever it is, the agenda every morning when we wake up is to get beyond myself and to get into his presence. I want to know where he's at. I want to feel him. I want to see him. I want to know him. I want to be a part of what he's doing. Well, there's my friends from Poplar Bluff, my God in heaven. And 
Uh, now you've done gone and distracted me. What in the name of God? I'm trying to get in his presence and there they are smiling and I'm all messed up. <clears throat> but when I get up in the morning, that's my goal. I don't care if I'm on time for my first appointment more than I care about am I going to be in his presence when I get there. One night I came home from, are y'all bored? Well, now listen, if you are, just pray through. I came home one night, it was late, and, and I don't know about all these other guys that travel. Uh, I have yet to find the glamour in it. And these people who think it's glamorous just don't have to do it. And when I get home, if everybody's already in bed, I'm, I'm usually going to try to go get in a hot shower. And that, that bun coffee maker, hallelujah, has already throttled up. And it's got 12 cups of hot Folgers cl classic roast waiting on me. And you can get in his presence easy with Folgers. All you coffee snobs, the reason you can't feel God, because you're not drinking Folgers. <laughs> you pour that water, and we got talking about it at the table. You got to pour that little drippity drip funnel over that thing and watch that water just, you, you be lost. You be so bitter by the time that gets a cup made, there ain't no way you're going to find Jesus. Uh, there we go again. So I got home. Everybody was asleep, and it was about 11 15, 11 30, and, and I started a pot of coffee, and I was going to go get a shower. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to come back and get in that massage chair and get that airplane out of my system, and then I'm going to yet be in the bed asleep just shortly. And as I was headed to the, the bedroom there very quietly, the Lord spoke to me. He said, stay up a while. Oh. I know y'all all so spiritual. If he'd have said that to you, you'd have levitated. But I'm just thinking, I want to see you, but could you come quickly? Could we do this like a rapture situation? Just bam, here you are, and let's... But the Lord wants to know where we're at, and he wants to know how much we want to see him and be with him. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll stay up. And, and I, I got showered and went and sat in my recliner and started drinking coffee. And off out on the periphery, I could feel just in the spirit, just that little bump, just whoop. And I could feel him getting closer. And, and then about 1.30, he's closer. And about 2 o'clock, I had made my way into my office there at home, and I was sitting at my desk reading, drinking coffee, and all of a sudden, it, it literally was like a haze filled my office. And I fell down on my face in that floor, and I wept. There was such, I, I, I can't even begin to explain to you the presence of God and what it felt like in that moment. And, and it went from like 1.30 or 2 o'clock until 7 o'clock in the morning. Finally, at 7 o'clock, I was able to get out of the floor. And the thing about the presence of God is you can stay in it all night long and be rested when it's over. And I got up that morning about seven out of the floor of my office and just the Lord began to speak to me. He said, don't, don't leave, lose my glory. Don't, don't lose this. Don't ever get to the place that you think this don't happen on a regular basis. Don't ever get to the place that you think these moments only come once a year or every two or three years. I'll fellowship with you like this every day if you'll make room for me to. Then the Lord began to talk to me about Obed-Edom. When they were looking for somewhere for the presence of God to go, Obed-Edom, without even consulting with his good wife, he just said, you can bring it to my house. Bring the ark to my house. And now he probably went on ahead and told her, you're going to have to move the couch and some junk out of the way because we're going to put, and he put the presence of God right in the center of his home, just left it there. And the scripture says that everything that was connected with Obed-Edom was blessed. All of his businesses, all of his business partners, everything he was affiliated with or associated with became blessed for one reason, because he made room for the presence of God. We have, we have learned how to um, set time aside for him. And, and we feel it feels easier to come once, twice, three times a week, four times a week into his presence than to live in his presence all the time. And then we've inoculated our, our mindset with, with phrases like, um, you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Well, I got news for you. We have no earthly value if we're not heavenly minded. Our earthly value increases by the more that his mind becomes ours. Paul, in all of his wisdom, said to the church at one point, my little children of whom I travail again and birth for you till Christ be formed in you. 
He, he knew there was something about the nature of Christ that if we would have that in us, if we would let it be formed in us, it would take us to a place of spiritual maturity we've never been to before. But I think sometimes we come to church with an expectation of disappointment. We're coming with hope, but we expect to be disappointed. I've heard the statement my whole life, Brother Gaddy, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Well, I mean, if you're a doomsday prepper, well, there you have it. But I'm getting out of here early. I'm just going to go ahead and be on the record with it. I believe he's coming quicker than some of them post-trip people. And Scott, he's going. And uh, if he don't come early, I'm still going to be ready for it. But I'm going to be highly disappointed if it's not early. But I'm, I'm planning on getting out of here before all that mayhem starts. Uh, but we, it's, it, it's, a, it's a mindset that we've allowed to inundate our thinking. And we bring it to the house of God. I'm going hoping that I get a touch from God. But if I don't, I'm just going to bless his holy name anyway. I'm hoping that I'll get a word from God. But if I don't, it's okay. God is good. Well, all that's great and all that's true and all of that is right. We, we should feel to some degree that way. But I think we come to church sometimes with an expectation that God's really probably not going to say anything to me. Okay, if he don't, that's fine. But don't come in here thinking he's not planning to. Don't come in here without an expectation. And I'm going to tell you something. The scripture said of that little blind fella, the, the, one of the recordings of that story, the scripture says, and the Lord would have passed him by. There are some people that get ignored service after service and day after day because we let God ignore us. But then when he reaches out to his friends and he's like, hey, has he stopped? They told the little brother, no, not only has he not stopped, but you're embarrassing us. You're, you're getting out of control. You, you need to hush your mouth. And the book said that he cried out all the more. Jesus, he didn't change his prayer. He just changed his intensity. He changed, and I got a feeling that probably we would see a lot more interaction with Jesus personally if we were a lot more desperate for him than what we are currently. I'm not saying we don't love him, but I'm saying when I've got alternatives, it makes my desperation to find him a lot less. When I've got another way of escape and I don't need him to be my way of escape, then you understand the point I'm making? And I think sometimes if, if we would walk into the presence of God every day at home in the house of God with an expectation, I'm going to fulfill my obligations. I, and, and no, it's not religious tradition. Praise and worship is not religious tradition. It's the way that we current day people get into the presence of God. It's our going through gates and courts. That's how we get to where he's at. So when we come in here and these amazing singers and musicians are doing such a phenomenal job, we give honor to all of you. But when they're doing what they're doing, there should be an expectation in the pews from us that you know what, they're not doing this for me. I'm not going to, we ought to say today, I, I'm no longer going to let the praise team do my worship for me. I'm not going to let you praise God for me. I am going to let you lead me into his presence. I'm going to let you lead me through gates and courts. I'm going to let you show me the way. But if they're going to do this, there ought to be some expectation in my heart and in my spirit and in my mind that if I want his presence bad enough, I'll go through the process and I'll fulfill my ceremonial obligations to get to where he's at. Because as we just read, if we don't do it his way, we're not getting to where he's at. <clears throat> New converts, we oftentimes talk about, you, you can tell somebody's worship by you can tell whether they're a new convert by how they worship. They have not been saved long enough to expect to be disappointed. <laughs> they're still in their infantile stages of working, walking with the Lord, and they have no idea that uh, the rest of us have figured out that God's not always going to be God. And so since they're not agnostic, they have an expectation that God, that's why the miraculous follows new babies in the, in the kingdom around all the time. They, the gifts of the Spirit operate where they're at all time. They don't know, come here from Sikkim about it, but it's just happening wherever the little brother goes. There's a guy in New York years ago who got the Holy Ghost. Am I boring you to tears? He got the Holy Ghost, and he heard them preaching. He was a homeless guy. They, they'd been preaching about that you could go into, and, and anoint with oil and just pray for people, and they read that out of Scripture. So that little brother came and got some oil after church, and they didn't see him for a week or two. And the pastor of this church gets a call from the police. And they said, we've got one of your parishioners down here at the jailhouse. He said, I beg your pardon. Well, who is it? And they told him who it was. He said, well, I don't know the brother. I, I don't know who that is. Well, he says, you're his pastor. 
He said, well, that may be the case. I can't help what he says. I'm telling you, I don't know him. Describe him to me. And they described him. He didn't look like anybody the pastor knew. He said, can you please come down here and get him? We cannot release him without somebody coming to get him. So he went down to get him. And when he gets there, he asks the desk sergeant up front, he said, why, why is the little brother incarcerated anyway? They said, well, the hospitals, a couple of hospitals have called us on him, and we had to come arrest him. What in the wide world was he doing down at the great hospital that made y'all have to arrest him? He was praying for people. He believed what they told him to such a degree that he got oil from wherever he could find it. And he was going in and out of hospitals, praying, just walking in, a homeless brother, walking up in somebody's room he don't even know, and anointing them with oil and praying for them like he had heard them pray for him at the church. The problem was God was healing them. And the hospital got mad because their patients were getting healed, and the only thing they could attribute it to was this little homeless brother down there who actually believed I can get past the veil in my life. I can get into the Holy of Holies. I can get to where he's at. <clears throat> but if we're not careful, we've got this mentality in the church that we can't actually get to where he's at. We believe he's there, but he's not accessible. In the Old Testament tabernacle plan, they had certain things that they, and I'm not going to go through it, but if you've never studied the tabernacle and, and prayed through the tabernacle, it's, it's really an amazing journey to get on and, and do it regularly. But there were certain ceremonies and processes that they had to fulfill all the time. And you, it started with you raising a lamb, a sacrificial lamb in your own home. And you, you could not risk farming that out to somebody else. So let me just start right there and tell you, you can't, you can't farm your eternity out to somebody else. Whatever you're going to bring to Jesus, you better be particular with it. You, you better watch over it. You better keep it. You better watch that thing, make sure that nothing tarnishes it. You, you don't want your sacrifice of praise to be something that, that's tarnished, tarnished and marred and messed up. So they had the first, they had the sacrifice. They had to keep that, and they had to make sure it was well-groomed, well-fed, in good health, because when they brought it, it couldn't have any kind of problems with it. Then the high priest took that and they offered it as a sacrifice. Well, it, before they did that, they had to wash. They sacrificed the lamb. The blood was put into a laver. The, the meat hook went into the sacrifice, on and on and on. Then they get to the holy place. And according to, we were talking in the office, but according to Jewish legend, from the door of the tabernacle to the veil was about the, the space of six man steps. Six being the number of man. The scripture goes on later and says, having done all to do but stand, stand therefore and see the salvation of the Lord, which indicates to us very clearly that there comes a point that you will have done all you know to do. You will have exhausted every exercise, you, but when you get to that place, don't stop and do nothing from that point forward. <clears throat> I'll get to that in a minute. So uh, having done all to do but stand, stand therefore. So they get to the veil now, the priest had blood in that little laver that he had in his hand. He had some incense burning in it. And he had to get that liquid blood into the Holy of Holies to put that blood on the mercy seat. However long, however, the scripture does not say they stood out there at the veil. They went through the process. They went by this table of showbread. They went by the Aaron's rod that budded. They went by the golden candlesticks and on and on and on. And they went through this process. But when they had done everything they knew to do, they were left standing at a veil. Now, most scholars agree that that veil was anywhere from 19 to 24 inches thick, 22 inches. And they're right here. They're just face to face with a veil. That veil was stretched all the way to this right-hand side and hung on columns and, and had uh, sockets that hung on pegs on that side and the same on that end. It went all the way to the floor and it went all the way to the ceiling. There was no way for them to get past it. There's no mention that I can find in Scripture anywhere where there was an opening in that veil, nor in, in Jewish legend or in historical references to the veil in the tabernacle. There was no way for them to get beyond that veil, yet God required them to go beyond that veil and put that blood of that sacrifice on the mercy seat for the rolling ahead of the sins of the people. So God required them to get somewhere, but he made it impossible for them to get there. The scripture says, having done all to do but stand, stand therefore. Now, we don't know how long they stood there. There's, to my knowledge, I haven't found a biblical reference about how long they actually stood at the veil. I do know they didn't stay there until the blood dried up because the blood had to get to the mercy seat. It had to be poured on it. 
So whatever happened or however long they stood there, the Lord was mindful of that blood and he was not going to let that blood be shed in vain. He's mindful of the blood and he's not going to let his blood be shed in vain. I don't care how long you've looked at that impossibility and I don't care how long you've looked at that situation and how impossible it truly does seem. The blood was not shed in vain. God is not going to let his promises to his people fall to the ground and die. So when you've reached the end of it and there's nothing else to do but stand there and stare a veil in the face, just stand there and stare that veil right in the face. Don't move. But the propensity of humanity is when I get to a certain place and things are not happening anymore, do y'all mind if I take this off? I've got a thick neck. I like ties, but my God, they choke me to death. Uh, what was I, uh, you, we get to that veil, there's nothing else to do. So our humanity says, well, nothing's happened. So I must have done something wrong. Remember I said we're the kings and queens of second guessing? I've done something wrong. So I turn around and I go all the way back out here and start over again. I go wash again. But Paul, I believe it was Paul that made a statement about laying not again the foundation of repentance, but pressing on, moving toward the mark of the high calling, that place of perfection. There, have you ever wondered how these people that, that we find out circumstances in their life later on, but in, in the moment they, they wrote beautiful music, they did amazing things, and it was so powerful. And, and you find out later on, wait a minute, the story of their life was not quite as pristine as I thought it was or what it, has seen, it seemed to be on the, on the surface. But they learned how to live between sin and the altar. And we love that spot. We love that place between where I fail and where I get redeemed because there's so much mercy and grace in the love of God as they're so deep and rich and powerful. And we get addicted to it. We, we, we sin, we have our problems, and then we come to the altar. And that place of mercy and grace, we see things about him there. We find out things about him there. We experience things about him in that place of mercy that we don't see like that anywhere else or any other place in our walk with God. And so Paul makes a statement, you've you got to move on beyond that. This, this is the infantile stage. Receiving the Holy Ghost and being forgiven that very first time and being washed in the blood of the Lamb through baptism, all of that is not the zenith of our walk with God. It's the lowest point of our walk with God. Everything from that point forward builds off of that and builds on top of that. And we should go higher and higher and further and higher and further in Him. But there are moments and seasons, especially with season changes that come to our life, we go through all of the process and time and again, we get to another blank veil. We just get to a veil and there's nowhere to go. And we hear all the reports, we've got this report coming in and that one and they're being blessed and they're being blessed and this is happening and they're having 700 kids and, and I can't even have one and my God in heaven, they've, they're just blessed coming and going and I don't hardly have enough money to pay the light bill and I'm doing everything they've done and I'm the only one in here that's ever been there but I have done what the scripture says not do, uh, compare yourself among yourselves and I have looked around a few times and said to the Lord, I'm doing everything he's doing. I don't understand why he's being blessed and I'm not being blessed. I don't understand why doors are opening for them, but they're not opening for me. I'm doing everything they're doing. I'm doing it at the same time they're doing it. I don't know, but the timing of God is so perfect that sometimes it, be, it, it, it exceeds our human ability to understand. And God is not going to bless everybody at the same time, the same way. Everybody will reap the rewards. If you obey scripture, you can trust me when I tell you whatever problem promises are attached to that word. If you live by it and you push for it and you reach for it and you're obedient to the word of God to the best of your ability, I promise you there's coming a point in your life that you are going to reap the benefits of the word. But the writer said, don't compare yourself among yourselves because he understood that the timing of God is such that everybody is not going to get there on the same day. And if I get to looking at what God's doing for you, I start looking at what he's not doing for me, and then I get discouraged, and I start thinking, well, I'm not good enough. My past is a problem. I'm not good enough. I, my, that mistake keeps me from it. I'm not good enough. If I hadn't been that, if I hadn't gone there, if I hadn't done that, then God, but that's not true. Because of the blood, we're all equal. We're all the same. And it'll be your day soon enough. Just hang on. 
<clears throat> be not deceived, for God is not mocked concerning his promises. For whatsoever a man soweth, you were talking about it earlier. If you sow finances, you do not reap turnip greens. If you plant corn, you don't reap cabbage. If you plant cabbage, you reap cabbage. If you plant tomatoes, you get tomatoes. If you sow financially into the kingdom, when the season for that to come back and produce a harvest in your life is there, there will be a harvest ready for you to take. But just because you put money in the offering this morning does not mean that you you're going to walk out of here and every last one of us are going to be a millionaire before the sun goes down. In fact, the rewards of God for some of us are going to be that our bills are paid. God knows too, <laughs> he knows too well that some of us can't be saved with more than just enough. But if God provides you with just enough, you're as wealthy as a person that's dripping rich. <clears throat> so you got to put seed in the ground to reap a harvest. But he said, be not deceived. God's not mocked concerning his promises. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's a promise. That promise was made to us before we were ever in the womb. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season, if you take that word due season, those two words, and transliterate them into English terminology, that scripture would read, be not weary in well-doing, for at your appointed time you shall reap if you faint not. Everybody in here has appointed times all along the path ahead of you. God doesn't wait till you've done it to make a promise. He makes a promise, and he lays the provisions in place over and over and over. And the, the challenge is God's trying to get us to get up and move toward that provision and we're trying to sit here and get him to bring the provision to us it doesn't work that way if I'm going to have what God has for me he's got it placed at the right season where I'm going to need that provision in that season and that one so what I've got to do is stay faithful and don't get weary and well doing because just beyond that veil that I can't get past so he makes the high priest accountable to something of impossible nature <clears throat> you, you can just count on it. When you can't figure out how God's going to do it, it's God. If you can figure out how to make it come to pass, it wasn't vision from God. It was you having a good idea. And they are not the same thing. So the priest gets to the veil, and they had to just stand there and wait. I have no idea how long they waited. All I know is they, they didn't wait too long. He did not let the blood dry up. And there came a point where the Lord translated them. Now, when I was a child, they taught us that the high priest couldn't go into the presence of God with sin in their life. But if they did, uh, the, the Lord would kill them. And they had bells on their skirts, of uh, their robes, and <clears throat> they had a grapevine tied around their leg. And if those bells quit jingling, they'd drag them out. Well, I can't, that's not in the Bible. Um, there is some reference about the bells and the pomegranates on the bottom of the robes of the priest, but it wasn't for that in that particular situation because there was no way for them to get in his presence. His presence there was a type and shadow of the presence to come and eternity with him, and no sin can enter his presence. We, we, you, can't, you cannot get into his presence in, in a condition that's going to get you killed because he made it so that for them to get to the Holy of Holies, he had to translate them there. He had to take them that final step. Six was the number of man, having done all to do from the door to the veil. But that seventh step is the number of God. It's the number of perfection and completion. There comes a point in each of our lives where season after, it's not just a one and done deal. Over and over and over again, you'll find yourself at a veil. You'll go through a season where, I mean, it's just like everything's popping, everything's happening, everything's going exactly the way it's supposed to. Things are coming into your life, but you've got to remember those things that are coming into your life there are seeds that were sown maybe in another dry season somewhere back along the way. It may be something you're reaping now was sown 10 years ago when you were going through the deepest valley of your life. So <clears throat> be not weary in well-doing. Part of that well-doing is sow seeds. Sow seeds while you're waiting. Sow seeds of faith and expectation while you're waiting on God to do something. I don't know what he's going to do, and I don't know when he's going to do it, but he's going to do something. It doesn't take everybody in this room being on, firing on all eight cylinders every time we come together. Because there are going to be seasons that some of us come to the house of God. Brother Gaddy, I know you know this, but where the victory for us that day was just getting in the building. Can I get a witness? Anybody know what I mean? It, it was just like, my God, I, I had to fight a spiritual war 
just to get out of my front door and in the car and to come to the house of God. I, I'm sick in my body. I'm exhausted. My mind is shredded. I got problems. I, I'm dealing with things that nobody even knows about. I, my emotions are shot. I don't even know. <clears throat> and the victory for us that day was just getting in this building. Someday the victory is just holding a hand up. All these young deer running in the kingdom, just like young mountain lions, they just leap and run for Jesus. I'm so happy about it. Uh, I, I can't quite do that like I used to. But Oh, but some days just me getting a tired hand up is equivalent to that little brother running 75 laps around the building. When we get to that veil, sometimes we're just showing up. And the enemy says, you know what? You'd have more if you'd do more. I've done all I can do. I've done everything the word required of me to do. I'm willing to go back and start over. But the scripture doesn't say to start over. When you get to that point, having done all to do but stand, stand therefore. When you have witnessed to your lost children until they are sick of hearing your voice talk about church, just stand still. Your, your mind is going to say, invite them one more time. Push, 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 push. But maybe, maybe it's time to just hug them and tell them you're glad they're home for Thanksgiving. Maybe it's time to just put your arms around them and tell them you love them, you're proud of them. Even though you may not be proud of what they're doing or how they're living, be proud of them because they're your child and they, they have a right to expect you to love them. But I, I feel like something's got to break. It does. Something's got to give. It does and it will. But sometimes we're going to stand at a veil. Why? Because we get to the veil sometime before the other people involved in the equation are ready for that miraculous intervention. Sometimes we, we, people come to the house of God and we'll have 20 people show up that need the Holy Ghost and maybe it's only the will of God for 18 of them to get it. It's not his will that any should perish. I know, but those other two may not be ready yet. There may be some things there that are going to cause this, this new birth to be aborted before it can ever get off the ground. And so when we get to that point that we've done all we can do and there's nothing else to do, there's seasons that churches go through that maybe for two years. I talked to Brother uh, in, in Modesto years ago, Brother Keys, and I asked him, I said, how long was it after you came to Modesto before you guys had the break that you had and, and all that it became happened. He told me they were there for 17 years before they ever had the first breakthrough. I said, what did you do for 17 years? The, he said, I kept doing the last thing God told me to do. Sometimes we get, we get exasperated because that word we're looking for to come to pass had not come to pass yet. So we start looking for a new word. We want a fresh word. We want to, I need God to speak. No, no, no. You keep doing the last thing he told you to do. Until God tells you to do something different, keep doing the last thing. But I feel like I'm getting nowhere. Don't you know that high priest felt that way too? But everybody out there in the yard was hoping to God that high priest was not going to leave his position. They were hoping that he was not going to get weary with the process and abandon that place. He had done everything. The only thing left now is for God to do what he said he would do. But how do I know God will do that? I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. If you need him, he's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that sees and provides, not after the fact, but in time. God will always provide. Isn't it awesome that he gives us an indicator as to his nature all through the Old Testament leading up to this new birth, showing us that when you have need of me to be the healer or the peace speaker or whatever, I'll do that? Now, I'm going to go land the plane. So if somebody wants to melodiously play this piano very softly and give the people of God hope, that'd be beautiful. <clears throat> We've been thankful this morning. We've entered his courts and gates as far as I can tell correctly. I told Brother Gaddy years ago, now I'm not the most hermeneutically correct and homiletically perfected preacher. I just wander around wherever the Lord's going, and that's what I talk about. And then when it's time for him to do something, we'll let him do it. Um, I'm from Alma. Um, but we, we, are, we are programmed to believe that here, here's what I know. In Scripture, the Scripture talks about, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. But then the scripture says in another place, they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. And then the scripture says in another place, they endured. <clears throat> Those are the three dimensions of serving God. Suddenly, continuing steadfastly, 
and enduring. And sometimes our involvement with the Lord is suddenly. <laughs> we walk in here on a Sunday morning, and you've got a more lively guy than me with the mic in his hand, and the place just erupts and the joint goes crazy. Then you've got days like, you know, those continued steadfast days that it's like, I don't feel anything, nothing. So have any of you ever been to that place where you went for a few days and you just didn't feel God? I went 16 months one time, and I didn't feel the brother at all. Well, I take that back. When I preached, I'd feel a little flow. But as soon as I laid the mic down, it was flat and dead as a hammer. Sixteen months. And there was a lot of continuing steadfast in that season and a whole lot of enduring in that season. What I did not do was abandon the veil. I knew I had done everything he required of me to get to that point. And whatever happened next wasn't on me. That was going to be on him. And I remember the night it broke for me. I was sitting, my grandmother had passed away and our family kept her home and just used it for visiting and hanging out and whatever, eventually sold it. But I had gone to grandmama's and just by myself um, spent some time. And I had reached a point where I just couldn't take it anymore. And I got a revelation that night that that's really where God's trying to get us to, to that place that we just can't take it. I can't do it anymore. Not that we quit the kingdom, but that we quit trying to force him to do something. And I remember sitting in one of the recliners in her living room, and somewhere around 1 o'clock in the morning, I, I just I didn't know what else to do. I just didn't know. And I began to sing that song, Come Living Water. I sang it through the first time. I didn't feel anything. I was desperate. And I could feel a season was shifting. I was desperate, but I wasn't really expectant. So I sang it through a second time. Nothing. And then something shifted in my expectations, and I, I realized, whew, if I let him, tonight's the night. This 16-month drought comes to an end. I sang it through a third time. I sang it through a fourth time. And the next thing I knew, it was 8 o'clock in the morning the next day. And I was laid on the floor and talked in tongues and wept all night long. It wasn't too late. Wasn't too late. I was in Texas one day preaching and there was a lady apparently that had been at the veil for her kids for a long time. And the Lord spoke to me and I said, even if it's been 13 years since you've seen your child or talked to them, don't you give up on God because in his due season, in his perfect timing, it may have been 13 years, but don't you lose hope. The lady in the media department, Brother Gaddis, she just went nuts. And I thought, well, praise God. I didn't know her story. But on Tuesday morning, Within just single digit days from being exactly 13 years, she was at work, San Antonio, Texas. She was at work, her cell phone rings, <clears throat> and it was a California number. She didn't recognize it. And she normally would not answer a phone call from a number she didn't recognize. But the Holy Ghost prompted her. He said, no, answer it today. She answered that phone and she said, hello, and this female on the other end said, Mama, and it had been almost to the day, 13 years since she had heard her daughter's voice. She didn't know where she was. Nobody had seen her. Nobody had heard from her. She thought she was dead. She said, Mama, it's, and she told her her name. She said, I know who you are. She said, can I please come home? Yes, you can come home. She said, Mom, I don't have any money. Can you 
She said, I'll buy you a ticket. Don't you worry. She said, well, I need three. Three? She said, yes, ma'am. I've got two daughters that you've never met. The oldest one's 13 or 12. And I'm in trouble and I need mom. I need help. They flew home the next day and the following Sunday. They were all three in the altar talking in tongues. You may stand at that veil for a long, long time, but don't leave it. I don't care if you've got a child in the penitentiary. Don't walk away from that veil. I don't, think, I don't care if you've been waiting on God to do a physical miracle in your body for decades. Don't you walk away from that veil. There's no more for you to do, and this is not a performance issue. You have done everything God commands us to do. Now stand there. Worship him. Give thanks. Magnify him, not just for what he's done, but for what he is going to do. Because he made promises to us before we were any of us ever in the womb. My marriage is a mess. Stay at the veil. I was in the church one night, and uh, we were about to pray, and the Lord said, don't pray yet, just wait on me. And Brother Gaddy had been one of them services. Everything had just gone off without a hitch, just perfect. And we were at that point of ministry that God was, I knew, wanting to do something supernatural. And we were at a veil. He said, just stand here for a little while. We worshiped for 30 minutes. 30 minutes. And at 30 minute mark, the back doors of the building opened. And I kept having to encourage the saints of God because they're starting to get a little frustrated. We're all down here. You said if we wanted a miracle to come to the front, we're all down here. Now you're saying we gotta wait. And at 30 minutes in, the back doors opened. And one of the roughest, toughest looking pieces of humanity I've ever seen walked in. And I thought, uh-oh. I wanted to ask, have you come in peace? But when he walked in, he started surveilling the crowd. Well, you know, in today's environment, you don't know what that means. Well, some of the security people were watching him. And I saw the light as it hit his face, and there was something shiny on his cheek before it got to his beard. And I thought, stand down, boys. Hold on a minute. And I watched him, and he kept looking, looking, looking. He, couldn't, he, he was all in the seats, and he moved a little closer. And finally, his eyes located somebody right up here in the front. And I mean, it was this woman with like four or five kids down front. And that, that man was back there. And when he saw her, that, that shiny just spread. And it was tears. And those tears, he, he wept so much that it went through his beard and was dripping out the bottom of his beard. And he, he pushed his way through the people to get to his wife and four children. What I did not know was he had told her that morning, you go to that church one more time. I'm done. I, I won't be here when you get home. And she told him, I don't have a choice. I got to go. And apparently he had been a booger. He had been tough to live with. But because she wouldn't back away from that veil, God took her somewhere. Her expectations of God would not allow him to ignore her. Uh-uh. You may walk past everybody else in this building today, but you're not going to ignore me. And her faith was so powerful that it released the anointing of the Holy Ghost to flow out into that city. I was in another church one night. The Lord said, just hang on, wait. Another situation just like that. For 42 minutes, we waited, and a man walked in the back doors of the building. He and his wife had gone to their lawyer and the, the, the divorce papers were signed and only had to be filed in, on the following Monday. 
but neither one of them really wanted it. But it's just the enemy. And she just she's down front, and she worshiped all through that service. She wouldn't sit down. She couldn't sit down. And I looked up, and here comes this guy, and he was he was he had muscles on muscles. I could have took him, but I mean he was bowed up. <laughs> he came in the back doors, and he surveilled the crowd again, and he sees her. And about three minutes later, he's down there holding their little baby, talking in tongues for the very first time, because that little 110 pound woman wouldn't leave that veil. All the enemy's trying to get you to do is to back off, just walk away, throw everything you've waited on all these years in the trash, throw every ounce of faith you've had, every, everything you've ever believed God for, just discard it and, and, and say that it hadn't happened yet because of me. I'm telling you, I don't know why I keep feeling to say it, but God's going to give somebody in this building children. Now, I know I, I talked to some people in my house the other night that are in this room today about that, but you're not the ones I'm talking to. You've already had your word. There's some moms and dads in here. Your children will be sitting on these seats beside you before it's over with. You just, you just stay at the veil. Do I need to pray harder and longer? No, just keep praying. Just keep believing. Just keep expecting God to do it. Don't change that. Be not weary in well-doing. Remind him on a daily basis. Lord, you've made some promises. You might make a few payments, Brother Gaddy, on this building along the way, but just stand at that veil because there's coming a point where God is going to translate this church beyond a financial barrier to where it's not just going to be this building that you pay off You'll buy whatever property you need to buy to expand the kingdom. God will bless this church with finances. You'll pay off somebody else's buildings. Lord, you are you're beyond words. Lord, I guess my tutelage and waiting on you started with my mom all those years ago when we were just kids. Mama got to the prayer room early and stayed late. Music was already going before Mama ever left the prayer room. And we learned to wait on you. It was in one of those nights that I saw the first dead person raised that I'd ever seen that happen to. Your presence. I've been talking and sharing with these people what you've given me to say, but this right here is what we've been waiting on. This service, the music, the singing, the worship, oh, how beautiful and powerful it's been. But there's a different dimension of your presence that has settled in this room. Lord, to those children that are away from you and those parents whose relationships maybe is not what they want it to be with their children, let strength and peace be upon them today. Let the spirit of Rizba be upon them. This is not where this story ends. Lord, to that couple or maybe three couples that want children, there's one in particular they felt nudged in the direction of children open every door you want opened close every door that you want closed and take them beyond that veil because of their faith and trust and expectations of you Lord until that day comes we're going to stand at our own private veils and our own private lives and in front of these corporate veils. There is a revival and a harvest coming to this city and this region. There will be a day that Bishop Gaddy will oversee many, many works birthed out of this church. 
And in this season that we've been waiting at the veil, you've been teaching and showing and imparting so much stuff. Teaching us how to do it. <clears throat> how to join the pieces together. And I thank you for it. And Lord, there's been times that we all get to these veils and we get impatient. Lord, I would say for myself today, I believe, help my unbelief. In my spirit, I believe everything that you would say to me, but my flesh don't always comprehend it. So be patient with that part of me. Because I'm trying, I'm, I'm coming to where you are, I promise you I am. The scripture says that the elders died in the faith, having not yet received the promises of God. Lord, I'm making that commitment to you. I will. I am prepared to die in the faith at an old age, should you tarry. Even if I don't receive every promise before I die that you've made me. I'm not going to depart from the faith. I'm going to stay faithful. And Lord, there are suddenly moments in our lives, and I thank you for them. But it seems like, Lord, there's a lot more of those continue steadfast and enduring moments. So, Lord, would you give me grace to make it through those seasons? Now, Lord, we're going to pray for some folks here in just a minute because you've told me to. And there are some people in this room that have battled depression and mental attacks for a long time, and they want to be free of it. They're, they're tired of it. Their emotions are shot, and they're just exhausted from it. But they've stayed faithful. They're here on today. They're here because they have nowhere else to go. Where else do we go? And you're going to deliver them. You're going to heal them and make them whole. Lord, angels are going to leave this place again today. They've done it many times in the past, no doubt. But again today, angels are going to leave this place and go to our children and begin to stir their thoughts and stir their dreams and remind them of the sounds and the smells of the house of God. And today, your name is going to reverberate through this region into every community. People that have not thought about that name in days, weeks, or years even are going to begin to remember that name. Because we are about to go through a threshold and a veil between seasons. And you're taking us someplace that we're required to get but can't get on our own. So today, we're just collectively laying down our will collectively we're just laying it all down today and whatever it is that you want to do in our individual lives and as a corporate body we're surrendered to it and we receive it in Jesus name in Jesus name if you have struggled with depression and even anxiety and your emotions are attacked more than any other part of your life and you're ready for that to be over, uh, I want you to come to the front. I'm not going to labor over this. We're not going to just, I'm not going to stand here and talk about it for 20 minutes. If you want God to heal you and deliver you from that, you've got 15 seconds to get to the front. And the reason the Lord's doing it that way is because you know who you are and you're desperate so there's no reason to drag it out and ruin your faith. you got five more seconds. All right, if you're not moving now, don't even move. Stay where you're at. Our scripture reading, we have the right to expect to be in his presence. We have that right. And he has proven himself. He has a history of faithfulness. He's famous for it. Now I need a believer to come and get with every person up here. I need a believer to come find somebody. And we're going to pray with them. Because the cool thing is, we've all been there. Everybody in this room has been to this point at least once in our life. Maybe more often than that. And we will probably all go back. Get in front of them. You're going to lay your hand squarely on their head. Yeah. Yes. He loves you. Before we start praying for you, I just want you to get that through your head. He loves you. 
He loves you. If you're ready to let him love you and you're ready to let him deliver you and you're ready to get beyond this veil and you've waited for this moment and you're ready for God to do it, lift your hands right now. Believers, lay hands on them. Take authority over that depression and deliver them from it now. Come on. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Come on. Come on. That's it, believers. That's it. You're doing it. That's it. You're doing it. Come on. If you need to receive the Holy Ghost today, you can receive the Holy Ghost right here, right now. The Lord will fill you with the Holy Ghost. That's it. Come on. You're going beyond that veil. You've done everything you know to do. Now let the Lord take you the rest of the way. Come on, that's it. Receive it. Receive it. Come on. Don't stop until you feel it break. That's it, come on. Come on, let it go. Let it go. That's it, spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Stay with them, pray them across that threshold. Stop there, push. Push beyond this place. Go beyond this point.
Have you been in the dry season lately? Like that one I was talking about for 16 months. And it just, you can't think of anything that you've done. But it's just been the dry season. And you're ready for the dam to break. I want you to just gather right here in this front. <clears throat> Some of you are going to experience it today. But here's what I, I can tell you. Uh, come on, if, you, if you're ready for your dry season to break, get down here where we can see who all we're looking at. I know it's more than two, but... Uh, this is almost anticlimactic. But it's probably not going to break on today because it's not time. But this church has been through a, a lot of labor and growth and pushing and effort. And God, in all of his wisdom, knows when to sedate us. And I think that's what it's been for some of us. It's just been like we've been sedated. Just <clears throat> don't feel much, but I'm desperate to feel something. But Brother Yaddy, I may be wrong, and it wouldn't be the first time, but I think that probably it'll be sometime after the first of the year. Some of these dry places will finally, it'll, for the most part, all of them, will see that season end. But today we're going to pray that God gives you the grace to keep it up. Um, sometimes ministries get aborted and walked away from because it just seems like if it was going to happen it would have already happened sometimes we switch vision because if this vision was really from God it would have already happened no stay with it you're at a veil just hang on it, you, God's going to take you beyond it soon enough sometimes the grace to wait on God they that wait on the Lord now, I would love to be able to look up and see just a heaven's bounty just falling down on top of every one of you right on today, but it's not going to happen today because it's not time. And I don't understand all the timing of God. I do understand He has His own timing. Somewhere long after the first of the year, you're going to feel some things shift, and your spirit's going to begin to move with His spirit and flow with Him like you in a more easy way than what it has been up to this point. But I want Brother Gaddy to pray for us. I've talked a lot today. But you, you just cannot, you just cannot walk away from a veil. It's where you're supposed to be. Sometimes that frustration and that sense of hopelessness and helplessness is exactly what he's waiting on you to have to realize now that you've done all you can do you need to have a revelation that your efforts alone can't get you where you're supposed to be you do your part and then make it possible for me to do my part and i will and heaven will collide with us in the perfect timing of god and the day will come that you look back in these dry places and these veils that you stood in front of, you can't even hardly remember them. They are just so perfectly wiped away. So I want you to lift your hands. If you need, if you need God to give you the grace to endure this, the remainder of this season, lift your hands. Brother Gaddy, would you pray for us? And I'm done with this, but reach out. If you see somebody with their hand up, just make contact with them and pray the strength and the grace and the peace of God in over Jesus them in name. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Spring up, O oh well. Spring up, O oh well, of the Holy Ghost in this room right now, Lord. You see the honest cry of people, Lord, with their hands lifted in this sanctuary. We trust your timing, Lord. We trust the sovereign hand of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for the steadfastness in these that are standing at your veil. We stand at your veil right now, Lord, trusting that in due season, at that appointed time, it is coming, Lord. 
We declare that in prayer right now. It is coming in Jesus' name. That day of overflow, that day of bounty, that day of refilling, that day of saturation, it's coming in Jesus' name. Give us grace to stand right now, God. Give these ones grace to stand, Lord, at the veil, to be steadfast, Lord, to continue steadfastly. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for daily bread, Lord. I thank you for daily strength, Jesus. I thank you for moment by moment strength that you're giving. Oh, God, we stand at the veil with expectation right now, Lord. In the great and mighty and holy name of Jesus. In the holy name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's what I want you to do. If you are here at the veil and you're standing with expectation, I want you to get with somebody that is expecting with you right now. And I want us to praise God as we finish this service together. We can petition him, but we're not going to petition him right now. We're going to praise him together. Would you find somebody that's expecting with you right now? Come on, expecting with you. That's it. Come on, New Life. Go ahead and let your voice out right now. He kabo shatala bahaya. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. I'm expecting, Lord. I'm expecting, Lord. I'm standing at the veil expecting, Lord Jesus. Come on, I believe there's something else for somebody right now. If you'll just press on a little bit further right now. Come on, go ahead and give voice a little bit louder right now. Woo! Yes. Come on, give voice a little bit stronger right now. Oh, yes, God. Come on, that's it. When Zion travails, she will bring forth. That's the word of the Lord today. When Zion travails, she's going to bring forth. Oh, yes. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, we're in his presence right now. We've got in his presence right now. We're in his presence right now. Surrounded by your love. Woo! tola mahaya. Oh yes, here in your presence, such a sweet release. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I don't want to leave. Yes, Lord. Such a sweet relief. I can feel your joy rushing over me. I don't want to be. Oh, yeah, sing it, sing it, sing it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
presence. ask a couple of questions. How many of you here today, whether you're standing in the front, you're seated in the congregation, anywhere in this worship center today, how many of you feel like that through this service and through the ministry of the word today, God has spoken a direct word to you? Just lift your hand up. I want to see who you are. Just a direct word. Isn't that amazing how God does that? Isn't that amazing how God does it? How many here today, you responded a few minutes ago by stepping out. You needed the Lord to lift anxiety. You needed the Lord to lift that off of you. And you feel, you feel lifted higher than when you came down here just a few moments ago. And that, lift up your hand. You feel a lifting in your spirit. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. And I think we would be remiss to just move right on past that. Let's stop and give God praise for that right now. That means everything to those people that just lifted up their hands right now. Well, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I think it is so very, very important to respond to what has been said. And I just want to say this. I know that there were several things that were spoken specifically to our church. And even a couple things that were spoken to me as a pastor. Brother Shelton, I want you to know, I receive what God said through you today. Last night, I was getting ready to go to bed. And I felt a little nudge little bump I think brother Shelton calls little bump and I told the Lord I said Lord I am wide open I, I wanted to voice this I said I'm wide open to what you want to speak to me personally tomorrow and what you want to speak to our church so because of that when the word comes I'm verbalizing that I receive what has just been spoken I receive it into my spirit I receive it this whole week I receive it into who I am and who this church is how many of you feel like that you you receive what has been said you receive what has been said God you've been so so good to us we're not dismissed from your presence we're just dismissed from this service we're in your presence Lord and I pray you'd, you'd go with us and you'd help us and you'd keep us at that veil I pray God in the name of Jesus that you will do a work in this region That will amaze, amaze us. I pray it in Jesus' name, God. I pray it. I pray there would be a mantle, an anointing, far beyond, Lord, what you've ever done in Cabot before, Lord. But you would have your way and you would let your kingdom come and your will be done. And we're going to thank you for that in Jesus' name. Go with your people, God. Bless this wonderful church family this week. Keep your hand upon us, I pray. And thank you in advance for doing that. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. If you'd like to stay and pray, you're certainly welcome to do that. Whenever you would like to be dismissed, you're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Don't forget our schedule this week. We've got a great, great week coming up. May the Lord bless you. Brother Shelton, thank you for being with us. Amen. Let me say this. Hang on just a second, Sister Courtney. Let me say this. If you are here, and I, I felt this, and I'm glad the Lord just prompted me again. If, I felt this early this morning in my office. If you're here and you would like to sow into the ministry of Brother Shelton, and you want to do that with a love offering, I want you to bring that and just set that up here. I want to be a blessing over and above what this church was going to do. You know we do this at times, but if you want to sow into his ministry so that it'll just equip him to be able to do more of this around the world. Uh, bring that offering and just set it right up here. If you want to give online, you can just put it under offering and we'll make sure that we categorize that. But if you want to sow into Brother Shelton's ministry, I want you to just bring that up here and you can lay it right up here on the altar. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for giving bountifully. Thank you for giving willingly today. In Jesus' name. We got people praying. Let's be aware of that. Let's be sensitive to that. Let's